And I just got every sickness under the sun. I was always getting sick with just the cough and cold and just was a really sick person. And come to find out, I was living in black mold, so that didn't help. My name is Michael Rubino. I'm on a personal mission to make sure you don't get sick inside your own home. I knew there was something wrong. I'm just so relieved there's something that you can do about it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning into another episode. I'm your host, Michael Rubino. And today, special guest is Nicole. Nicole, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be here and share your story. Of course. Thanks for having me. So, all right, let's talk into this. When did you first realize that air quality was very important to health? Probably not until recently. Um, I discovered that mold was impacting my health in 2018, but I really didn't think about air quality until I became an FDN and just realized how much environmental toxins were just deteriorating our health overall. Okay. So obviously there had to have been something that happened to kind of come to this realization. So Mm -hmm. tell me, take me through this journey that you went through. What were you feeling? What were you being exposed to? How did this all come together? So in 2018, I found out I was living um, in black mold. I ripped up our basement carpet and found this much, no joke, I had a picture of it. I don't know where the picture is now, but this much black mold under our carpet, your worst nightmare. I remediated it myself without gloves, without a mask, with just bleach, um, and I threw everything away. And when I was living in that house, it was in Maryland. We had had multiple water leaks, floods in the basement. Um, and we didn't really think anything of it. We were just like, oh, let's dry it up. We didn't know anything about mold. I was living with chronic sinus infections, I had chronic migraines, really bad depression, really bad anxiety. I would walk into a room full of strangers and be like, oh my gosh, everyone's looking at me. Everyone hates me. And no one was looking at me, but I just felt so anxious in my body Um, and I just got every sickness under the sun. I was always getting sick with just the cough and cold and just was a really sick person and come to find out I was living in black mold. So that didn't help. (laughs) Okay. So you find it, you put bleach on it, you throw out the carpet, you think all is well, did the story end there all of a sudden you're better or no way. So I actually found a podcast that day and turned it on. It was called Learn True Health. She she had a mold expert on. And as I'm like pouring bleach on the mold, this guy's talking about how mold can impact your health. So we actually ended up moving out of that house. We ended up selling it a couple months later after dealing with the mold issue. Um, we moved into my parents' house and I started to become very interested in holistic health. I enrolled in a health coaching certification and then got a nutritionist certification and then became an FDN. It took years to heal. And I think a lot of people hear like, oh, you got out of the environment. You're good. Everything's fine. But it took so long to heal because there were so many layers that I was dealing with. I didn't mention I got diagnosed with PCOS. I wasn't ovulating, had a lot of trouble with fertility um, and that that whole process took years and years. And I can happily say now I have a two and a half year old boy, um, that was conceived naturally, no like fertility help. Um, so it was definitely a journey and moving out of it was the first step, but not the last. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So, okay. So but we have mold, we start not feeling well, you listen to a podcast starts to click for you. But there's a there's a gap here, right? So you probably had to have gone to at least another doctor to try to figure out what's going on with you. Um, probably yeah. before this all clicked and you realized, okay, mold is impacting my health. And yeah. I, I, I we definitely have to hear about that journey because you know, so many people they go to so many different doctors, do all these tests, everyone says you're fine, it's all in your head, tests show normal. And you know, I, I we gotta hear how this all transpired. So I think I went to less than a dozen, maybe eight different doctors. Um, I come from a family of doctors, so I've always been very trusting in the medical system. And I always looked at doctors as superior, right? They know what they're talking about. I go in there, I tell them my symptoms, they're going to give me a pill to fix the ill. And that's exactly what happened. Unfortunately, I went to psychiatrist first. I was on ADHD medication, um, anxiety medication, and depression medicine, 
I went to an allergist. I was on, I took daily Claritin. Um, I went to an ear, nose and throat doctor. I had two nose surgeries, um, like sinus surgeries. They widen my sinus passages because I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't breathe and I had constant post nasal drip and just, it just felt so much pressure in my sinuses. Nothing helped. Um, so I was doing a neti pot daily. I was taking, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a steroid for, um, like a nasal steroid spray. And then of course I went to a migraine specialist who I'll never forget this. I walk in there. She's amazing, has like accolades and just was the top migraine specialist in the area. She was really nice, but I will never forget. She had a diet Coke and Fritos on her desk. And she literally goes, oh, I just had a new drug rep, drug rep come in and he, she gave me this medication. Why don't you try it? It's free. And I was desperate. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. I'll, I'll try this. So took that. That didn't work. So she put me on prednisone for a month because my migraines were debilitating. Like I couldn't, I couldn't leave my room. I had to be in darkness. I would puke multiple, multiple times. And that gave some relief throwing up, but it just was horrible. Um, and the prednisone was even worse because it feels like you're like in a fog. And then of course I blew up like a chipmunk. Um, and yeah, I, I went to so many doctors and I felt crazy. Honestly, I felt like it was all in my head. I don't want to get emotional, but it was horrible. Um, just like not feeling heard and feeling like it's like something is wrong with you. And you go to all these experts and they are the experts and they're saying this medication should fix you. And you just feel broken. Um, so like finding that podcast and finding functional medicine and becoming an FDN and just treating myself as a lab rat, like totally changed my life. And it's why I'm so passionate about telling my story because it happens to so many people and they feel the same way. They feel crazy. They don't feel heard. And it's, it's not fair. We need, we need to hear people. Well, I don't mean to throw shade at the so-called experts, but 74% of the U.S. adults are on at least one prescription medication. Over 60% of the global population deals with at least one chronic condition. The life expectancy just dropped for the first time in like 66 years. Uh, We're not going in the right direction. So, you know, here's the thing. You went to almost a dozen doctors. They just said, let's try all these things that they hear about through their pharmaceutical reps. Right. Uh, it's kind of giving me that whole, I don't know, there's just that new documentary on Netflix that I started watching with the, the Oxycontin company. Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh my, yeah, it's giving me these vibes, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's like, because it's like we, you know, we we have these drugs, these companies make drugs, they push them to doctors, right? Doctors just start giving it out and telling people to try it. And then like if it works, great, they start writing that down. But we get people hooked on drugs, right? Because right. drugs solve a symptom. They don't solve a problem mm-hmm. producing that symptom, right? So right. we get into this whole thing uh, of all this. And then, you know, when things don't work, you must be the problem, not the drug. It's, it's right. impossible that the drug should should not work, right? It should always work. So then, then it becomes you're the problem. So then it's like, well, why don't you go see a psych- psychiatrist and put you on more drugs to handle right. the drugs that didn't work? Because now- how how is someone supposed to feel at that point? Yeah. Well, I and mean, then all these drugs have these side effects, which I was getting, I'm sure I got side effects, especially, you know, you know, with mold detoxification, the more the most important part is bowel movements, right? Daily bowel movements. Some of those medications were causing constipation. How was I supposed to detox from mold when I'm, you know, not having daily bowel movements? So it's not a cool thing to talk about, but it's so important. Yeah. And these these medications, it's true, just this vicious cycle. I I worked with a woman who was in her late 60s and was on upwards of 10 meds. And she had so many drug nutrient interactions that I could barely recommend anything other than just diet and lifestyle changes. We couldn't work on supplementation. We couldn't dig deep. She had so many things going on and we just couldn't even touch that because of all her drug nutrient interactions. But you know what is really cool about this whole thing? Like when the medical system failed you, you did something about it and mm-hmm. joined the medical system. Right. Right. That's so cool. Right. We don't, that doesn't happen all the time, but you know, you start some of these amazing stories with some of the most amazing people out there like yourself. It's like when something happens and we need to find answers and they don't exist, we take it upon ourselves to take action and go and get those answers, which is really right. cool. Yeah. 
It's been fun. It's been challenging, obviously, coming from a family of doctors. Um, I thought I was, you know, going to go the medical route. Um, I There is a part of me that wants to become a doctor, but not an MD. I want to get my doctorate in clinical nutrition eventually, but with a two-year-old not on the table right now. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. It's a learning experience. And I think that we can either take a diagnosis or an illness and make it our identity or make it our purpose. And I made it my purpose um, to help other people dealing with the same thing. I mean, I got diagnosed with so many things. I have chronic Lyme, PCOS, depression, anxiety, migraines, all those things. I could make that me, but I found out what's actually causing those things and address them. And now I feel amazing. And I'm just on a mission to help other people feel amazing because it's once you're on the other side and you know, like you were here and depressed and didn't want to live and now just love life and wake up happy without a migraine, without chronic sinus infections, like you just want everyone to feel that way. Yeah, no, I totally am with you on that. You know, I figured out how environmental impacts create such a huge problem for human health back mm-hmm. when hurricane Sandy was decimating homes. And we had just so many water damage environments. And out of that, I started noticing a pattern of people being sick. Right. And so now mm-hmm. I'm on this God forsaken mission to try to make the world a better place. Um, you are or die trying. Right. <laughs> and, and any, in any event, you had a family of doctors. And so Obviously, I'm sure you talk to your family. Yes, I love and that. <laughs> yes, of course. And you know, this I would imagine this was a medical mystery because, you know, it it, it almost is when you talk about the greater population of medicine, right? It's it yeah. this is still such a niche. Very few people know about this. Um and so what was that advice like from your family, you know, how how did that how did that support system work for you and Um, Did they learn through this just like you did? Yeah, so I didn't really dig super deep into mold and my health with lab testing until years later, until after I had a child. Um, But I did a lot of lab testing, like, you know, I did gut testing, uh, hormones, HTMA, all of that stuff. So I was working on my body's detoxification and I was always sharing what I was learning with my parents both my parents are clients. My sister is now a client. Um, this is a roundabout answer, but I promise that I'll go back to your original question. But my sister was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2019. And we were from Maryland. Um, I live in Colorado now. So once we moved out of my moldy house, we moved to Colorado, which is very dry climate here, but there's still is mold. Um, mm-hmm. So when my sister got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I always ask why. So I don't take a diagnosis and just say, okay, that's it. I, I try to think of how the person got there. What's the possible root causes. There's never one root cause what's contributing to this diagnosis. We ended up running, um, an organic acid and mycotoxin test on my sister. She had really high levels of both mycotoxins, and then she also had the mold colonization. So on the oat, she had high levels of mold. We've done, we've been working together for since 2019. What is that? Three, four years almost. Her symptoms have gotten drastically better. She wasn't able to work a full day of work. She had so much pain, a lot of like numbness, tingling in her hands, memory recall, brain fog, all the traditional symptoms of multiple sclerosis, which actually are a lot of the same symptoms of mold illness. And a lot of those have reversed and she has no new brain lesions, which usually when you have multiple sclerosis, you get more brain lesions as the disease progresses. So her disease basically stopped. Um, And it's really cool because when you have that And she's been to the top doctors at Hopkins and it's a disease that is debilitating and so sad and it takes over your life. And to be able to live like a normal life, like she's living now, it's, it's hard not for doctors to take notice of that. Um, So yeah, my parents are the best. I mean, my dad, he's a heart surgeon and he, he can't technically refer me clients because I think that would be a little weird if he referred his heart clients to me, but my mom refers me clients. My dad tells everyone, my dad's a client. He had mold. We've um, detoxed a ton with his mold. 
Um, he lives in Florida. It's very moldy there, <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's when you have these real life examples of people getting better after detoxing mold, it's hard not to notice. I agree. It's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's too loud to ignore at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, every, every single day I'm meeting more and more people and I'm seeing them not do well. Right. And then typically if you're calling me, you're not doing well and you're hoping I can help come solve your problem and just getting people out of the house to, to just, to get to remediate, to figure out what's going on with their house and go through the steps they're within a week or two, like starting to heal. Yeah. And you know, and it's, it's, it's just really interesting because this is just kind of brand new science unfolding, crossing over into the medical field right. and you're seeing mysterious illnesses start to improve when nothing else has been working as long as they've been living in that environment. Right. And it's, it's really incredible. Right. So as you said, it's like, you, it's just become too loud to ignore. Mm-hmm. Uh, have to share this with everyone and, and anyone. Yeah, I know. I'm, I've become the annoying friend. That's like, do you want to hear about mold or do you want to talk about pooping? Do you want to do, do you want to talk about minerals? And people are like, they're either very interested or they're like eating Doritos and being like, no, I don't give a shit. So sorry if I, I can it's hopefully okay. I can pass on here. <laughs> hey, this is an, it's an organic conversation. <laughs> Um, well, it certainly, it certainly changes the amount of invites that you get for Thanksgiving. Right. I mean, you know, (laughs) I think people, people are scared to have me in their home unless they specifically want to have me in their home. I don't know. I kind of want, you can come to our Thanksgiving and you can test our crawl space. You can go up in our attic. I'll just be like, I'll feed you and you can test my whole house. (laughs) You know, we have this situation here where people are getting sick, um, mold and bacteria because because the other thing that mold is really easy to identify just with the testing capabilities, but typically if you have mold, you also have bacteria. So they kind of mm-hmm. go hand in hand. You have both of these things impacting the body. We have the viruses that we get out in the world just by being exposed to one another. We have each other's bacteria that we share microbiome with when we're in these same spaces. It's just this culmination of, of attacks that our body has to kind of deal with all the time. And right. with, with mold and bacteria, especially in our own homes, and we're spending 90% of the time there taking 20,000 breaths per day, it's a lot of accumulation. And then mm-hmm. just factor that with our individual genetics, epigenetics, everything we're exposed to, other, other underlying health conditions that might be developing that coincide with all of this exposure. It's, it's a difficult road and a difficult battle. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, you've come out the other side of that and you became aware and you've educated yourself and you've kind of gone through that. And I applaud you for that. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. It's been fun. It's a lot. Mold is a lot to research. I remember I first the first mold book I read was Toxic by Neil Nathan. Mm-hmm. And I must have read it like 10 times. because I'm like, wait, what is he talking about? This is way too much information, but it's I think it's information that's so important. So if you guys, if anyone listening hasn't read Toxic, I I think it's an amazing book, mostly geared towards practitioners and doctors, but I read it before I was an FDN. I was just interested in health. So as long as you're interested, it's going to be helpful. So you, you mentioned earlier about how mold seems to have, at least for your sister, played a role in her multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting about mold specifically is I don't think we know of all the possible ways that it impacts us. I think it's probably way crazier than we can even put on paper today. Yeah. Because that's the first time that I've heard something with multiple sclerosis, right? Um, oh, really? Totally. There's but- a really good study that I'll send you after about the um, multiple multiple sclerosis and mold because there's a certain type of mold that attacks myelin. So multiple sclerosis is just demyelin demyelination. So it's basically there's myelin around your nerve cells and the mold can eat away at that myelin. And there can be other reasons for it, but autoimmune disease in general, it doesn't, you don't just wake up with multiple sclerosis. Like you don't just wake up with Crohn's or colitis, like something has to cause that. And there's a ton of research. If you really it's not going to say MS is caused by mold. That's never going to say that because then they can't sell the immunosuppressant drugs, right? Which are you created to... by mold. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's another story. So, oh, it's just so frustrating. Um, but I'll find that article. But it's it's interesting, and I think mold can it can cause any number of symptoms and illness because a lot of mold toxins, mycotoxins are ionophores, right? So one side is lipophilic, fat dissolving. One side is hydrophilic, water dissolving. What are we made of? Fat and water. Exactly. So it can go anywhere at once, which most things are either dissolvable in fat or either dissolvable in water. And if you think about it, water and fat don't mix. So if you have both and they're just like swimming around wherever it wants to go, And the fat loving part likes to go to the brain. So all these neurological issues, this is interesting and controversial. Both my grandparents on one side who lived in Maryland, who were both doctors, died of ALS. And I've never talked about this publicly, but it's Lou Gehrig's disease, neurological disorder. They both had a rapid decline and horrible, like that is the most slow, painful death. And this was way before I knew anything about mold. I wish I would have known what I know now because I would have tested them for mold, most likely found mold and tons of toxins. I mean, they were, my grandmother was like a bleach queen, like her house, my mom jokes that you could have like eaten food off her floor, but now knowing what I know I'm now, I'm like, no, I would have been drinking bleach because she just like <laughs> bleached everything. She was like the over clean population. Mm. So I think, you know, most of a lot of neurological disorders, it's not just mold, but what other toxins are contributing, aluminum, mercury, all of those different things that are contributing to your overall toxic burden and causing these slow, like rapid aging and then like slow death, really, because ALS is just, I don't know if you know about it, it's horrible. It's like probably one of the worst ways to go because your mind is still there, but you're, you can't swallow, you can't eat. My grandmother had a feeding tube. It was just horrible, horrible to watch. Wow. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't, I don't know enough about it. That's for sure. I know um, too much, unfortunately. What I do know though, is that the amazing work Dr. Dale Bredesen has been doing um, on the neurodegenerative stuff with regards mm-hmm. to environmental toxins. Um, you know, he's kind of coined the term inhalational Alzheimer's early onset yeah. of dementia due to environmental toxins. Right. And so, um, we understand that this is a neurotoxin yeah, and that neurotoxins, right. Are going to impact us differently. And, um, it's really interesting because when I was kind of talking about the brevity of this, it affects us all differently. Right. And that's, I think that's going to be one of the harder things to nail down because our medical system is kind of like, all right, these symptoms mean this label and these yeah. symptoms mean this label. And when you have this label, you take this drug and this label, you take that drug. And so we get into this situation. Well, when it comes to environmental toxins like mold, it can give people different labels because depending on how their body responds, that might produce different symptoms. Mm -hmm. And when you have something that complex, you're not going to be able to just have a pill that everybody could take. Right. It just, it just completely defeats our system and understanding of how our medical system actually works. Yeah. So we're in this space where it's going to be really difficult to understand fully, like how this impacts us and what do we do about it? And I think what's hard too, is that people feel threatened on both sides. Like you're either functional medicine or you're Western and there's no meshing, but I think to move forward and to help more people, we need to mesh and the functional medicine Maybe we need to, I don't actually want to learn about drugs, but maybe we need to learn about drugs and maybe the Western medicine needs to learn about nutrition and detoxification and just like more, we all need to know how our bodies work and how things impact our bodies because there's, you know, I've, you get on Instagram and it's like, there's this camp of, oh, your bodies know how to need to, your, your bodies innately know how to detox. So you don't need to help your body detox. Well, if your liver is overburdened with mold and other toxins, it's going to have a harder time detoxing. And if you're just constantly adding to your toxic load, you need help detoxing. And then that doesn't even include like the people who have a genetic susceptibility to not be able to detox like MTHFR SNPs or genotypes that have like an increased susceptibility to mold illness like HLADR. So it's, we just need to learn more. No one needs to be not everyone needs to be an expert, but I feel like it needs to be more well-known of like what things do to your body. I mean, listen, I didn't get, I haven't 
got tested for all the gene mutations, but I'll tell you this, I did a detox uh, like two Januarys ago now, and I felt like the best I ever felt. I ended up losing like 20 pounds in the process just because yeah. like my body was kind of operating a little more optimal. Mm-hmm. I felt so much more energetic, right? It's not, now that I'm thinking about this, I like guess it's time for me to do another detox probably, but uh, <laughs> I'll like, do it. you know, the thing about this is, is like you say, well, our bodies detox naturally. And yes, our bodies do detox naturally, but it doesn't mean that it's detoxing optimally. Exactly. Right. And no one's pooping. Like literally no one poops. Every, like every time I have a client intake form, I'm very specific about poop. Almost everyone's constipated that I work with. And you can't detox if you're not pooping. You're recirculating toxins in your body. Right. You know? Yeah. You have that issue. Uh, we obviously, you know, you said we had a mesh functional medicine, Western medicine. So like integrative mm-hmm. medicine, essentially. Right. And yeah. With that being said, you know, there are life-saving drugs and we need to have life-saving drugs. That's great. But we also need a plan to get off these drugs, right? And that's where functional medicine kind of steps in because yes, it's like, we need this drug. Let's keep this person alive. Let's save their life. Let's Mm -hmm. prescribe this. Let's get them on it. Great. Then at the same time, let's figure out how this person got to this position where they needed the drug. Right? right. And then let's start to figure out how we can correct things and put them on a path to healing so mm-hmm. that they no longer need the drug. Yeah. And that is the part that we're missing in Western medicine, where it's kind of like, here's the drug and take the drug. When do I stop? Well, I don't know. Maybe never. I'm not sure. Just keep taking yeah. it until you no longer need it. Maybe we'll wean you off, but there's real no real plan to identify exactly what's going on. And we just all keep saying, well, we just need more research. You know, more research is needed. Well, when, when are we going to do this research? Because and it's hard. Yeah. It's hard with research too, because you have to think of who funds research, like research for supplements. There's not a lot of, a ton of research on supplements because supplements don't make big pharma money. And then also I get asked, a lot of my clients are very research oriented and I do a lot of education with my clients. They get access to a course, a mold course, like a, just how your body works course, research that's public, that's funded and that's going to be published. It takes a really long time and it's also very expensive. And you have to consider that people, practitioners working with clients, like I collect my own research. Is it ever going to be published on PubMed? Probably not. But I do multiple retests with clients, especially with mold clients and autoimmune and chronic illness clients. That to me is considered research. And I think I don't know if there's a pool of people collecting that research, but I think that would be so cool to pull together all of these before and after. What was your protocol? What did they do? Like what dietary changes did they do, especially with mold, just so we have this like collective database of like what worked, you know, just so we can come together and see that research. I think that would be awesome to do. Well, you definitely could take that data and compile it and publish it. Oh, okay. You definitely can. Just, just throwing that out there. Um, I've been collecting data for a long time. Uh, I've been yeah. doing this for 11 years. I've been collecting data. I have a lot of data. At some point, I will, when the pieces make sense and they all align, I will definitely hire a firm to help me put together a valid paper that could be published and peer-reviewed. Amazing. Right, right now, there's still so many other pieces that need to that we that we just need to get an understanding of. And that's really bridging the gap between our health and our home. Mm-hmm. Because I can go and tell you that you know X amount of homes have mold based upon this based upon all the data that I have, but then it'll be like, well, but you only test homes where people are sick, and so they're more likely to have mold. And then I would be like, well, wait a second, I thought mold wasn't a problem. Yeah. Right? So we're That's in this good. little song and dance here, but I think we need to get I need to get continuously get more data from people who just want to check their home and might not necessarily be feeling symptoms mm-hmm. or, or at least are aware of it. So we have a bigger pool set. And then I all, we also need to get better medical data from these homes. It'd be really nice to say like, okay, 74% of people that have stachybotrys in their home ex- display these symptoms. And yeah. 56% of people that have high levels of aspergillus display these symptoms. And because if we can start to build that roadmap, then we can really start to understand more about how, what symptoms are expressed on a, it's always going to be statistical element because obviously every single human being is different, 
But to be able to have that understanding, I think would be really helpful for the medical community, for the scientific community to really start to see and understand just how widespread this is. Cause it is, uh, you know, it's huge. And I know, oh, I'm, yeah. I know I'm biased cause I talk to people that are not feeling well, that coincidentally happen to have a lot of environmental problems. But, right. you know, if, if I talk to people once in a while that were not doing well and had no environmental problems, that'd be one thing, but they all do. Right. right. And then they all notice a difference when they handle those environmental problems. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're onto something. And of course I could be wrong, but I if I'm right, <laughs> if I'm right, this can help seven and a half billion people, which yeah. will be way more by the time I'm gone. Mm-hmm. And that is something worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you agree. I love that. I totally agree. And I do not think you're wrong. I think you're right. So we, we really got sidetracked quite a bit, but this is a really good sidetrack. I'll tell you that. Um, I want to just get more understanding about, you know, you, you, you find mold, you get into the situation, you're not feeling well. We didn't get to, to talk about, yeah. And you said you went to see a psychiatrist and you were dealing with anxiety and depression, but one of the bigger things that are, are kind of not talked about enough, right. Is the mental health aspect of things. And there's, there's, I know there's a layer to this because heck, if I'm not feeling well and I go to tons of doctors and I don't get answers uh, on why I'm not feeling well, or what do I got to do to get better? I'm probably not going to be a very happy person. I don't know. It just wouldn't, why would I be happy if I'm in despair? But there's also legit neurological impacts that mold can have that actually create some mental health challenges. What were some of the things that you've experienced? From a scientific perspective or from just my symptoms? I want to just hear from you and we'll, okay. we'll, leave, we'll leave science alone for now and we'll loop <laughs> it back in when appropriate. So I dealt with anxiety and depression pretty much my whole life until a couple of years ago when I addressed all the inflammation. Um, I cannot talk about science. When you, t- when you talk about mental illness, you have to talk about neuroinflammation. Um, there is a guy, Brendan, his Instagram is hello holistic savage. He's really great at talking about neuroinflammation as it relates to mental illness. Um, but if you have some type of mental illness, you have to look at neuroinflammation, the gut and minerals. So looking back on myself, I was so, I wasn't eating, like I wasn't, didn't have an eating disorder, but I just didn't eat that much. So I was constantly malnourished. I had blood sugar dysregulation, definitely had neuroinflammation from mold. Um, my anxiety and depression didn't start when I was in the mold. It heightened. It was my worst, like the worst time of my life. Um, and that was the time that I was desperate to feel better, but also like wanted to give up because I was like, what's the point? I feel like shit. I feel horrible. I just had this feeling. I was like, even though people didn't hate me, I was like, everyone hates me. What's, you know, what's the point? And it's just this like intrusive thoughts. And that was really bad in mold. And I had never experienced that before, even though I had experience anxiety and depression. Um, and I definitely think that was the mold and it, it just wasn't, it wasn't me. It, it, it just like took over. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like I said, it, it can produce neurotoxins, which, mm-hmm. you know, we've seen hallucinations and all kinds of unexplainable phenomenon. Um, you know, and of course the anxiety and depression piece, and obviously all of that just adds to the layer of stress that we experience as human beings living on planet earth here. Yeah. And it just compounds, right. And it makes it 10 times worse. Like, have you ever heard of the term mold rage? Yeah, I definitely had that. You had some mold rage. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically like where you have zero patients, um, yeah. you know, and can get pretty combative at the drop of a dime. Yeah. Um, I compare it to like testo rage. If you have a ton of testosterone, you can have very similar to the, the rage is very similar. Like roid rage or something to, to roid, that effect. Yeah, I call it sure. testo rage, but yeah, roid rage. Cool. Yeah. And, and I think that paints a picture because like I would say in talking to many families over the years, you know, you'll see some of these like rage symptoms um, explode. I actually had a client once that um, just called me screaming out of nowhere. And, um, I had no idea what was happening and I'm, I had no idea why he was screaming or anything like that. And he called me and then he just hung up on me 
And then he called me about an hour later and was like, I'm so sorry. I went into the house, even though I shouldn't have gone into the house while, you know, before you guys are ready to remediate or whatnot, I had to get some things and yeah. like, he just kind of like completely lost it. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because we don't really talk about that so much either, but a lot of these families, like they'll report that like the husband had no symptoms, but like would just be on oh, edge wow. all the time mm -hmm. and like flip out for the smallest thing that they normally wouldn't. Um, and so, you know, there, there's obviously some behavioral challenges too. Um, I know that kind of ties into mental health a bit too, but we also have like pans and pandas where you have yes behavioral issues that are abnormal when they're not in mold, they like, you know, or when they're on vacation or they leave house, the house for the weekend seems to subside. Right. So right. it's really interesting, all the different ways that this really impacts us. And it's just kind of like, at this point, I can't believe everyone doesn't want to make sure that they have the healthiest environment possible because of how much this really plays a role in our yeah. health and, and well being. I think for, for some people, it may be like denial or ignorance is bliss, you know, and, and I just, from working with people, there's some people that don't want to confront it because they know how expensive remediation is going to be, how expensive this path is going to be, but you have to get to that realization that it's possible to heal. And yes, it's expensive, but your health is so worth it. And it's like, you know, our life expectancy what do you said it was decreasing for the first time ever, right? For the first time in like 66 years, 66 yeah. years. But what, like, even though that life expectancy is decreasing, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to live medicated, miserable, having roid slash mold rage? Or do you want to actually live a life on the other side of being just happy and healthy? Cause it is possible. And I think more sit like sit mold success stories. That's why I love that you're doing this, right? You interview a lot of people that are on the other side of it and people like realize they can heal and they can get through it. But I just, there's so much just hesitancy of starting something like this, whether it be remediation or like functional medicine because of fear. Yeah. And like, as far as the cost aspect goes, like when you start looking at the data, like the average person spent, the average sick person spends about $400,000 in medical care in their life in their life. And, and through that 400,000, they typically do not get better. Yeah. To top wow. I didn't that know it was that much. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as I'm sure there's people listening right now that are like, yeah, you know what? I've spent like 50 grand so far this year, a hundred grand so far this year, man, if I'm sick another four or five years, yeah, that's, I'm there. Yeah. And that's the problem. Right. And so when we look at this, we're like, we're willing to drain our bank accounts, just continuously going for treatments and doctors and second opinions and third opinions and 40th and 50th opinions. And mm -hmm. we're just, and we're not getting anywhere. We're just spinning our wheels. We're driving around in circles. Yeah. And now we're in massive amounts of debt. But then it's like, well, what is the, how do we address the root cause of the problem? Maybe it was 40 or $50,000 in remediation was all you needed. Maybe right. it was less. Right. And maybe on top of that, obviously, I mean, look, once you have a buildup in your body, you know, you have to remediate so you, you don't continuously build up your body. But you also have to, you're going to have to see a specialist to, clean the body. Right. And so right. you're getting into the situation. Okay. Maybe it's 40 to 50,000 there. Maybe it's another 40, 50,000 there. You're still 90 to hundred grand, which is a lot less than 400,000. And you get, wow, I didn't back. know it was that much. Okay. I'm going to use that statistic. Look it up, go for it. It is yours to use. <laughs> you know, you. when you look at it from that perspective, it's like, I'm getting a deal and I'm going to heal faster because that 400,000 is going to take years of your life that you won't get back. Right. And to top that off too, like we're, we're, we're talking about worst case scenario, right? There's a lot of people out there right now that could be listening to this that can actually take action when problems are small, when mm -hmm. costs are low and make minor improvements to their environment right now before they get sick. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the other part of the equation is like, we, we know that this is a problem. We know that obviously time of exposure is going to play a role into this. Right. An amount of exposure is going to play a role in this. So I, I can go outside and take a breath 
And I'm going to inhale some mold spores because right. mold, mold's everywhere. It's outside, right? As people say, mold is everywhere. But then when you're inside, that mold might be 10 times higher than what you would breathe outside. So your particle concentration per 20,000 breaths would could be astronomical, which is typically the case. Now, if we maybe weren't sick, but we actually tested our house and we looked for abnormalities and we saw like, okay, there's some stuff that's a little weird. And then we go and figure it out that we have this minor leak that's just minor right now and we fix it before it becomes a big leak and a big problem that costs a ton of money. Yeah. There's that side of things that we don't even think about because typically we, as Americans, especially we don't fix things until they break. Yeah. Right. So it's like, we wait for our roof to fall in before we're like, Oh yeah, I guess I need a new roof. Yeah. There's just a lot here to unpack a lot here to figure out and a lot here to solve. Yeah. Uh, so You're doing the work. when you, when you got out of the mold and you became a FDN and you, I'm sh- I'm sure you came up with your own protocol and fix yourself. Yeah. What was that? What was that journey like? I was like a human lab rat for about four years. I still am. I love tests. I just, I'm a data person. I want to collect information. Um, so I just ran all the tests on myself. And then I don't know that the word expert to me is interesting because I don't know that anyone can actually be like an expert and know everything. So I definitely am not an ec- a mold expert, but I just became very mold knowledgeable just because of working with hundreds of clients and also myself and my sister. I take I take things very seriously and just, it's just my mission to help people. So I'm glad I went through that process because I got to experiment on myself, saw what protocols didn't work. I don't have a specific protocol. I mean, I use certain things for everyone, but everything is different based on labs. Um, But, you know, my, I worked on detoxification, really nourished myself. I was like depleted in minerals. I like didn't have any. Um, And minerals are the spark plugs of our our, life. They're so important. Um, So really worked on that and did a lot of mindset work. Um, You know, people talk about like limbic system repair after you get out of mold because it's, it's, there's a saying brain on fire, which is very much how I felt when I was in mold. Like not only was my brain on fire with anxiety and depression, but migraines. And I just needed to calm my brain and calm my nervous system So once I was out of mold, I started breath work. I did actually did a full day breath work retreat when I was pregnant. That was the most profound experience of my life, just sobbing and releasing like trauma that I didn't even know I had. Um, So that was a huge part of my healing breath work. Talk therapy never really worked for me, Um, but mindset work, uh, meditation, just all of that, just calming myself and making my body feel safe. I think that's a really important part of, yeah, supplements are super important. Nutrition is really important, but if you don't believe in your body's ability to heal and you don't feel safe in your body, it's going to be so much harder to heal. I totally agree. And like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff you're doing that, you know, really leads to more positivity. The Mm -hmm. first time I ever meditated, I set the bar a little too high. It was with Deepak Chopra actually. Okay. I haven't and even done so that yet. <laughs> he did the guided meditation with a, a group of us. And I, that was the first time I ever meditated. And speaking of crying and sobbing, we did this one exercise where we took ATVs up the mountain, which was pretty cool. And at the top of the mountain, we all kind of sat in a circle and we were sharing stories of trauma. Um, and it was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely just screwing this whole thing up, but it was some sort of exercise. Okay. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I remember I'm five years old. And this is like, I must have repressed this memory and like completely locked it away somewhere. I'm five years old and I'm like, I had suicidal ideation. I was bullied and all this kind of stuff. And as I'm like reliving it, I just start crying. And I cried the entire way down the mountain. Aww. And I was like, try, you know, it was like, I was trying not to judge myself. I really couldn't under, I didn't understand what was happening, frankly. And then I realized like why I'm crying. I wasn't crying to like pity myself. I was actually crying because I was like, dude, a five-year-old boy wanted to end his life and not be a part of this world anymore because, you know, other people were mean to him or whatever that reason may be. 
But I realized like, man, nobody should have to feel that way Mm -hmm. at such an early age, like five years old. You're, you're not even, you don't even understand life yet. Right. There's so much life for you to live. And for me to, to see myself as a five-year-old and thinking life isn't worth living. Um, that was, that was tough for me to see. And I think, I, I don't think it was for me. I think it was just the realization that there are, there has to be other people going through similar struggles in life, thinking that life isn't worth living and, you know, mold or not. Right. It's just, it, it, it was just such a profound experience for me, but through that, it, like pain that I re-experienced, I really, for really deeply believe like that this, whatever I'm doing, you know, and, and all the positive things that I do alongside of it and trying to leave the world in a better place than I'd found it. Um, to me, that was like a real connection that I made spiritually with what I'm trying to do. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to do this stuff. I'm sure you feel the same way. There's no award ceremony. Um, there's no applause, right? It's, it's just, you just go to work and you try to try to just do every day better than the last Mm -hmm. and hope that you make an impact, you know? And like, I, I know you've changed hundreds of people's lives, as you just said. And I know I've done the same. And I think if, if nothing for else, if I were to die tomorrow, I think I would be at peace with that. Um, I may be upset that I'm dead and I didn't get to continue my journey yeah. here. Cause I feel like, you know, I feel like I've, I've only accomplished just a small minute school, what I actually want to accomplish. But uh, at the end of the end, yeah. at the end of the day, the point of the story, as, as I said, is we have to kind of find a balance with well-being and health. And mm-hmm. even when times are tough, we have to really understand that they're tough for a reason. We're supposed to learn something through it that, that I believe in. And it's important to believe in something because yeah. that's how you, that hope is what we have as human beings to evolve and grow. And when we lose that hope, and when we, we lose our purpose, you know, it's hard to bounce back from that. And, um, you know, I understand a lot of people listening, they might be going through it, you know, it from a health perspective, mental health perspective, um, you know, could be for them. It could be for their kids, their, their parents, their loved ones. At the end of the day, it's like, we just have to, we have to really shift our mindset. Um, and, whether it's meditation, breath work, I don't care what, what you do, just do something that makes you empowered to take the next step. Cause that's, yeah. that's what it is. Like we're all worth living. You know, we're all, it doesn't matter who you are, what you do. We're all worth the life that we have. And there's, it's our choice to do something positive or negative with that life. And mm-hmm. even if, you haven't been a perfect person. I, I'm, I'll am i never be perfect. We can never get there. We just have to strive for it and hope we get somewhere close. It doesn't really matter because you can be somebody else starting right now and you can be better than you were yesterday right now. And um, mm-hmm. I hope that, you know, a lot of the work you've, you've done is, has been a similar experience. Yes. Oh, I love that. I could cry. There's been like 10 times I wanted to cry, but I held back because I think this is recorded. (laughs) It is recorded. Yeah, we could cry together, though. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm completely on the same page. I mean, mental health, it's there's so many epidemics. And I think they're they happen. It's not just a mental health epidemic. It's a health epidemic in general. And then some people it's affecting their mental health. Um, I mean, you can't meditate your way out of mold, as you know, but meditation and breath work and just positive thinking is so important. Um, you know, your body communicate like the gut brain connection, it's very real. We, our thoughts become reality. So if you're thinking negative thoughts all the time, sometimes you can't prevent that. Like I couldn't prevent my negative thoughts as much as like I wanted to, but getting out of that environment and just believing in my body's ability to heal was the first step. So I love everything that you just said. Amazing. I love how aligned we are and and making sure that (laughs) we're getting people healthy, both physically, mentally, spiritually, all the above. Cause I think it's, 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 it's really ties in together and it's so important. Um, I want to, I always ask this one question before we go. And so you're going to have to be victim to this too. 
Okay. If you go back, let's say to 2017, right before you got sick, knowing what you know now, what would you say to that younger version of yourself? I'll give her a hug, first of all, and I would tell her that it's going to be okay. I think that's it. Good. Short and sweet. I like it. Yeah. And final question is, if you could only offer one piece of advice, this is going to be, I think this is going to be really hard. Oh uh, yeah. Damn. Kind of it's only one piece of advice here <laughs> to someone else who may have gone through similar struggles or maybe going through similar struggles than you went through. What would that piece of advice be? There's people out there that can help you. You just have to find the right person and don't give up. That's two things. Sorry. Mm-hmm. It's okay. We'll, we'll allow it. <laughs> Nicole, this has been a, uh, you know, a roller coaster of a conversation, lots of ups <laughs> and downs, uh, motions all around good and good. And, you know, even experiencing some of the negative ones is, um, it's still good sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Uh, this was an amazing conversation. We'll have to do it again sometime. I'd and, um, Anything you you can need for me, anything I can ever do for you, please let me know. And uh, thank you for, for taking the time to be here with us today and share your story. Of course. Thank you. I was honored to be on. 